ne? Okay, colleagues, shall we begin? How about that? It's five minutes past six. I think that deserves a round of applause all by itself. Um, welcome to this evening's debate um, uh, on the green economy and the national development uh, plan. Uh, someone did phone me and said, ooh, you remember the NDP. We thought everyone had forgotten it. So we kind of said, yes, but it's the green economy we're really talking about. Uh, so welcome. Um, there will be a, we don't have a keynote speaker. So what you're going to get this evening is two inputs. Hopefully you all received the background papers. Um, and the two, or the, the, they were both one individual, one was team based. But the authors will give you a brief input, uh, about seven minutes each. Then each of uh, the panelists, who I'll introduce in a, in a, mo in a few moments, uh, will give you uh, 10 to 15 minutes on, uh, of their own position. But the point is to try and move it as quickly as we can to interact it with you. I realize how difficult it is on a Monday night to be lectured at by what will then be uh, seven, eight people talking at you. Uh, so we get it into your hands as quickly as we can. So I thought I would start with um, not the formal introductions, but a joke that I thought would alienate almost all of you. Um, particularly the women and the environmentalists in the audience, which I think is always a good way for a school of governance to start. Um, and it's about a man who gets uh, phoned by his wife uh, who says, please buy organic vegetables on the way home because uh, it's your turn to make supper. So he kind of goes into a supermarket and he goes, where, where are the organic vegetables? And the, the guy goes, I don't know what you're talking about. So he goes and he finds some vegetables and he picks them up and he says, these are for my wife. Have they had poison sprayed on them? And the guy says, no, sir, you'll have to do that yourself. Um, <laughs> there goes half the audience, as I thought. So, um, and these are not plastic bottles of water either. <laughs> Everything's going wrong. So the debate, I should say, has been, there, there is a partnership which my colleague Walid will, will introduce in a second, but our partnership has worked very closely with the Partnership for Action on the Green Economy page uh, and we're thanking them in particular for making this event possible uh, this evening. Uh, building on this debate uh, that happens tonight, we then move into a round table. In the round table, we'll probably gather 50 to 60 people uh, in a room for a day, and they really have to thrash out the implementation challenges. So in a sense, a lot of the questions that I'm, I'm hoping you'll be coming up with will feed straight into that session, uh, which will be about a month from now, I think, or three weeks. But we're really there try and understand, take these big ideas and, and uh, big commentaries, but turn them into how on earth do we make this thing move forward? How do we roll it out? What are the challenges on the ground? So that'll be coming up um, in a couple of weeks uh, time. And I'm told for those of you who understand Twitter, which I don't, I think it's on the wall. It's hashtag OR Tambo debate with all sorts of capital letters in places that I don't understand. And my communications manager is shaking her head yet again, but just tweet Whatever you do, tweet, tweet those things and you'll get there. So before I make any more mistakes, Walid, would you like to introduce the partnership? Thank you, David. Uh, puts a whole new perspective on shopping for my wife uh, from now on. Um, uh, <laughs> But uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, all of the distinguished guests around the room. I may not be able to acknowledge and recognize everyone, um, but that's why my favorite expression here in South Africa is all protocols observed. Um, so on behalf of the four partners, uh, namely the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, uh, the WITS School of Governance, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, and the United Nations Development Program, uh, let me welcome you this evening to uh, the eighth edition of this prestigious debate series on the implementation of the National Development Plan. And as David said, tonight's topic is on the green economy. As many of you who have participated with us in, uh, in previous debates may know, these debates actually pay tribute to the qualities and the legacy of O.R. Tambo, who is well known to have been a social justice advocate, a strategic thinker, and a formidable debater. Tonight's debate is particularly opportune as it comes in the centenary birthday month of this indomitable man who was born on the 27th of October, 1917. Therefore, it is befitting that today 
we join the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation to mark his centenary with this debate using his amazing debate skill, intellect, and accountable leadership to help South Africa protect the legacy of a green and just world that he fought so hard to ensure. But the three other partners to this debate platform also bring their unique comparative advantage to the table. The Department of Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation plays a vital role in ensuring that recommendations and other outcomes of the series are adequately considered in policy-making circles of government through the key role that DPME plays in planning, monitoring, and evaluation around the NDP. The WIT School of Governance brings its power of research, analysis, and academic excellence, as well as the independence of this platform to allow for a free-flowing discussion of ideas, bottlenecks, and policy solutions to accelerate the implementation of the NDP. UNDP uh, plays a crucial role in providing technical knowledge and expertise, leveraging the global knowledge base of the entire UN system to share international best practices and comparative country experiences around the issues being debated, but we also provide some seed funding for these debate series. In this spirit, and as the UN system mobilizes its capacities and resources behind national efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and to support governments to implement commitments under the Paris Agreement, I am really pleased to be joined here tonight by several of my UN uh, colleagues representing the Partnership for Action on the Green Economy, or PAGE, and I would just like to request all of my colleagues from the UN, but also from the steering committee of PAGE, to just quickly raise, up, raise your hands to show uh, your presence here in case colleagues would like to interact with you. Okay, so we have uh, quite a few colleagues around the table, but uh, there are more that weren't able to be here tonight, but I'm sure they will be a conduit to, to those that are not here. But PAGE is a, is a multi-country initiative formed by five UN agencies, namely the UN Environment, UNEP, the International Labour Organization, ILO, the UN Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, and the UN Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR, and UNDP, my, my organization. And PAGE basically provides a range of services that can enable South Africa to transition towards a greener economy from capacity building support to institutional coordination assistance to research and the production of relevant uh, material and publication that can inform policy debates around the green economy. PAGE South Africa is anchored in the Department of Environmental Affairs and I'm happy to see that we have colleagues from DIA here with us uh, tonight and has provided resources to support this debate as, as David said. So I'd like to thank PAGE for making this uh, debate opportunity a possibility. Previous Tambo debates have uh, explored the implementation viability of the NDP by understanding the implications of the implicit policy choices sector by sector. They have considered the interaction between the vision as stated in the NDP and its institutionalized operation. Such dialogue has helped shift entrenched positions, break frames, and enable new perspectives and implementation solutions to emerge. By exploring the options and constraints for implementation involving all stakeholders in society, be they government, international partners, civil society, the private sector, unions, and citizens, this series of public policy and technical debates are actually an important contribution towards forging a social contract between the state and wider <coughs> society. Tonight's debate promises to be no different as we seek to unpack chapter five of the NDP which aims to ensure environmental sustainability and an equitable transition to a low carbon economy. The subject of the green economy is motivated by recent events that impinge on South Africa's ability to make this transition. I am confident that our esteemed panelists who will be introduced uh, more directly by David will help us explore the multiplicity of issues that have dominated media headlines and that relate to the green economy debate. 
So our main question tonight is, will South Africa's renewable energy pathway uphold the aspirations enshrined in the NDP and the vision of OR Tambo? We trust you enjoy what promises to be a robust debate in a free-thinking space, as universities and centers of learning should be. Each of the panelists and resource persons who will be introduced now by David are eminent intellectuals and change agents, and so we are honored to have them here with us tonight. We invite the audience and also all of you to engage in this discussion, to raise issues and interrogate some of the, 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 the views that will be shared. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks, Walid. So what we're going to do is take the two position papers first. I'm hoping you all got at least one of them or preferably both. Has anyone got them? Put your hand up if you got one or both. Okay, so that's eh, about a 30% response rate. You should read more on your email. Um, so first up we have from the school, we have Dr. Ivor Sarakinski uh, from the Witt School of Governance who will speak first for about seven to 10 minutes. Um, and he'll be followed by uh, Dr. Retibile Melamu from the Innovation Hub. Um, she wrote it with a team, she tells me, uh, but she's taking responsibility for it. We'll take those two inputs uh, and then I'll come back up here and introduce the panel and they will then, if they want to, respond to those two inputs and or to each other. And as I said, we're trying to get through this quickly so that we get to you and you get to interrogate them as well. And if you're wondering why these bright lights are on, it's because we're also being live streamed on some obscure channel that my communications manager will tell you about. But you can watch all of this later, you can pick up things that you missed and so on. It will all be on our page at some point if you understand where YouTube is. Okay, Ivan. Well, good evening, everyone. And let me start by thanking the organizers for arranging the discussion this evening. If it was tomorrow evening or Wednesday evening, there would have been a problem because it's a tough call talking about the green economy and having to balance that off against Champions League football. <laughs> so the timing is perfect. So I only have a few minutes. I'm going to present some quick arguments that inform my position paper. So let me start off by making some claims that hopefully will irritate people in the audience and on the panel. And the first claim I want to make is that in terms of global greenhouse gas emissions, South Africa is only responsible for between 1 and 2% of the global total. <coughs> that means that if South Africa cuts its emissions by half, which is a huge ask, the effect on global emissions is marginal and minimal. Now, the reason why it's important to make that very clear at the beginning is that we have a whole range of policy initiatives around uh, reducing South, Africans carbon, South Africa's carbon footprint. And the point here is that these interventions are not cheap and they will have significant negative impacts on the country's GDP performance over the next decades. So if we're going to have carbon taxes, input and output costs go up. That impacts negatively on GDP. The price of goods and services goes up. To what effect, to what end, to what consequence? And I raised a whole range of issues with that. And uh, these are the kinds of themes that come through the various policy documents, the NDP, the Climate Change White Paper, IPAP, the New Growth Path, etc. These are not cheap interventions and they will impact negatively on South Africa's economic performance over time. Can we afford them? Can we afford them? National Treasury is about to action carbon taxes and they refuse to ring fence these taxes. So the budget cycle will determine the resources available for green economy interventions. No special money. So where's the money going to come from? 
You've heard of the Global Green Fund. And if you think that that money is going to flow, don't hold your breath. Uh, remember the Millennium Development Goals and the pledges that didn't translate into real money. So uh, the money is not going to come as easily as we would want. Um, so these are the kinds of contexts that I think are important for discussing a green economy transition. Now, there's a whole debate about what the green economy is, and I'm not going to get into doctrinal disputes and contribute to global warming with more hot air about these conceptual issues. I want to suggest that the green economy is about driving economic growth through interventions designed to reduce carbon emissions, to find economic opportunities in reducing carbon emissions. And I want to suggest that there are a number of sectors in the green economy that are important in this regard. And the sexiest one is renewable energy. Everyone's into renewable energy. And I want to suggest that South Africa is not accruing and won't accrue the benefits of renewable energy. We're not going to get local manufacture. We can't compete with mainstream manufacturers of components. Our rear forces prices down, there's no room for manoeuvre to subsidise high cost components. Why should we pay so much more for technologies that only function for a short percentage of the day? Solar technologies, eight hours. Wind, sporadically, if you're lucky, you'll get ten hours. The capital outlay for a technology that's intermittent is, I would argue, wasted capital. In a country with low economic growth, limited uh, economic opportunities, I think that there are better ways to drive uh, socio-economic <coughs> development to achieve a whole range of goals instead of pursuing the rene renewable energy option. My final point in response to the renewable energy debate is simply this. The rate of innovation in renewable energy and other energy sources is so spectacularly fast that the current renewable energy technologies need now will be outdated in a decade. And we're watching nuclear fusion very closely. The private sector's involved. For the first time ever, they've got more energy out of a laser process than before. Watch the space. Rather burn coal for another 10 years, because it's not going to make much difference to the global average, and then get in on the ground floor with the new generation uh, clean energy technologies. Don't waste scarce capital on existing inefficient renewable energy technologies. Where is this going coming from? Energy efficiencies is another area of the green economy, solar water heating, um, efficient lighting. Well, the light bulbs are manufactured in China, so we don't get the jobs dividend from that and we don't have significant rollout of solar water heaters apart from RDP houses. The middle class heavy consumer of electricity isn't using solar water heaters. Why not? There are a whole range of regulatory issues. I think these are more important perhaps than punting renewable energy as a technology. Energy efficiency could actually save more. Other sectors in the green economy arena are uh, Waste management, South Africa's way behind the rest of the world in uh, recycling. Uh, recycling saves on carbon emissions. That is a way of creating employment, socioeconomic development uh, at low cost and high labor intensities. One can meet socioeconomic challenges quite easily with that. And wherever you go in South Africa, you'll see waste pickers. There needs to be work to formalize uh, those waste pickers into the mainstream economy. That's where the jobs are, not on high-tech solar energy uh, plants. Um, other areas, uh, biofuels, uh, and I'm trying to focus on a range of uh, areas outside of renewable energy because I think there's so much more to the green economy than renewable energy. Food security is an issue. We can't use uh, certain uh, agricultural products 
we only are able to use uh, products that produce bioethanol, and the blending with petrol is a major opportunity here, which we're not seizing. Uh, our blending ratio is too small. It's about 12%. In Brazil, <coughs> it's 25%. The more you blend, the more opportunity you create, and the jobs are in the agricultural processing of the resources for uh, bioethanol. Uh, major opportunities there that aren't being realized. A final area of the green economy that deserves serious attention is uh, green building materials. And here we link it into waste management. Uh, their technology is to detoxify mine sludge and other waste resources. And you can use uh, fly ash from power stations for uh, uh, cement and concrete mixes that are far more environmentally friendly in terms of reduced carbon intensity. Remember, cement is highly carbon intensive. And we're not taking uh, advantage of all of that. So why aren't we achieving the goals of the green economy? I want to suggest is that we've underestimated the complexity of doing all of these things simultaneously. We're trying to do too much with too little resource in an environment that is unbelievably complicated and difficult to align and coordinate to achieve uh, optimal outcomes. The reason why our outputs in the green economy arena, as I've defined it, are quite uh, underwhelming <coughs> is because uh, it's not because the green economy is the problem. It's, it's because um, uh, we, we've, we've underestimated how hard it is to actually do this kind of stuff. We haven't put in place the appropriate uh, institutional mechanisms, the coordinating mechanisms, and we haven't found ways to generate the finance in innovative ways to make us completely independent of these promises from overseas agencies who have their own agenda. They want us to buy the components for their wind turbines. Uh, we haven't found ways to solve those very, very difficult challenges. So thank you for your attention, and I'm sure we will continue this discussion shortly. to time. Um, and now we have Dr. Retabile Palama from the Innovation Hub. Um, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, thank you very much also to the organizers for inviting the Innovation Hub to be part of this uh, grand um, uh, event. As the chair indicated, I'm not, I didn't write the posi position paper on my own. It was a collaboration uh, between uh, some of my colleagues who are sitting at the, at the, at the end, uh, Maloba and Gracia. I'm mindful of the time, so I'll go straight uh, to the point. Um, I'll be more optimistic than the previous speaker, and I'll, I'll try to focus on renewable energy. Uh, I'm glad that he focused on the other sectors of, of the green economy because um, our paper focuses a lot more on renewable energy. Um, we, we had an opportunity to read uh, the NDP Chapter 5 in detail, and we're very uh, encouraged about what, about what we found there. Um, and we found it to be uh, aligned to the ideals of O.R. Tambo. In fact, uh, the paper does start with a quote uh, from one of his speeches, I think the one that he made at the UN in 1976. He says, I quote verbatim, we will have a South Africa which the young of the country have the best that a humankind has produced. And we, we have found the chapter five of the NDP very optimistic in its outlook. Um, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't only talk to issues of uh, low carbon energy, but it talks about resource efficiency, making sure that we use our resources in such a way that the future generation uh, will, will benefit. But what we also found encouraging from the paper is the fact that they were mindful of the challenges of a developing state. So the green economy is not supposed to um, uh, put aside the developmental agenda of the country. Um, in fact, that's one of the areas where I disagree with the previous speaker. Its aim is to ensure that the country actually develops, and, but it develops uh, as efficiently as, uh, as possible. But it also addresses the issues of inequality and also affordability. It's very mindful that 
uh, uh, implementing the chapter five of the NDP or this vision of low carbon transition will be very complicated, will uh, require a lot of coordination. And that's why we appreciate the work that Paige is doing in making sure that it helps various actors within the ecosystem to coordinate uh, their efforts and to make sure that we, we achieve a lot more impact. So uh, just to say, uh, the paper does uh, reflect on how far we have come with regard to this transition. Uh, if, if, if you look at uh, how policy was developed uh, just after the, the democracy, uh, the issues of green economy were on the peripheral. Um, and, and, and shortly I'll use the example of, uh, of, of the renewable energy sector. But to say, uh, if you look at most of the government policies and strategies at the moment, uh, the principles of green economy, which, is, which are efficiency, 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 whether you are using your energy efficiently by tapping into renewable energy or you're losing less of your energy, it's, it really speaks about efficiency. They, they, are, they are reflected in most of government uh, um, uh, policies. If you look at DOE, we're still waiting for that IEP to, to be published. So perhaps uh, the panelists at a later stage can discuss what we need to do with, with some of these um, initiatives or policies that have been hanging for years. And if you look at the DTI, uh, they have, uh, through the IPEP, they do promote uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing doesn't necessarily mean we're going to manufacture from scratch but it can also mean that we can assemble here and create jobs. So just because we can't do that which China uh, is doing, doesn't mean that we can't uh, play in that space. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to counter my previous speaker as I go along. Um, yeah, but uh, we, as I indicated, the work that Paige has done the, in helping us as a country achieve our SDGs is, is also very important. So, so let me uh, get into the energy um, uh, sector, speci specifically renewable energy. Um, in 1998, uh, the country published its white paper on energy. And renewable energy was um, given some space and thought at the time. But when it was uh, developed, it was only looked as, a, as I said, peripheral, as an energy source that's suited for rural electrification. And so that's where we, we, we have come from. And in 2003, when the white paper on renewable energy was published, at least there we made uh, quantity, we, we committed to quantitative um, uh, targets. Uh, we all know that 10,000 uh, gigawatt hour by 2013. We did not achieve the, the targets by 2013, but uh, in 2013, we had made a significant progress towards achieving that. Uh, through the renewable independent, I'll just say 4P, uh, RI4P, I twist my, my, my tongue sometimes. <clears throat> so we, we have uh, uh, made significant uh, progress uh, with regard to that. Uh, and if you look at uh, the program since its inception, uh, the six years, uh, 6.3 has at least been procured. We're not sure whether all of it will come online, but we know for sure that of that half is already online right, uh, has added to, to capacity. That has led, although this renewable energy is supposedly not contributing to the economy, it has added 200 billion worth of investment. It has also created, yes, some of the jobs might, might be temporary, but it has created 31,000 jobs. So we, we admit that it has its own efficiency, it could, we, a lot more could be done with, with that program in terms of uplifting the communities in which these projects are done. But, but really it's one of, it's a great example uh, of um, a program or an initiative of different departments uh, working towards achieving um, uh, the goals of government, the, the goals of the key objectives of government, job creation, alleviation of poverty. Uh, but this program uh, came to a halt two years ago, as, as, as we all know, and uh, a lot of uh, reasons have been given why it has stalled. And, and they range, and uh, uh, the audience uh, here probably knows, uh, are aware of some of those. One of them was that uh, these renewables are way too expensive. But we know that uh, at the end of the fourth round, uh, they... The, the cost reduction in solar PV, the utility scale, for example, had gone sub, is it sub 70 cents? 
Yeah, it had gone uh, sub seventy cents per per kilowatt hour. I mean, uh, and it has it had uh, drastically dropped by uh, up to eighty percent. Yeah, around about eighty percent from the initial round. So really, I don't think cost is an issue here. Another um, argument that was put uh, forward was that, um, you know, ESCOM will think about it, uh, they will find time to implement it at some stage, and we're still waiting. And I think they even, uh, the, the DOE went further to even defy what uh, the president had pronounced in the sauna by just uh, stalling the, the, the program. And, and of course, there is an issue of nuclear that come into, into the, the, the play. I, I, I hope our panelists will, will also discuss that issue, how it affected um, the, 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 the rollout of the last rounds of the RI4P. Um, we, we have a lot that you've written on the paper, so we, you can go into the paper to find out about what we think uh, the country needs, uh, the issues around capacity, resources, innovation, not only in the form of uh, tech innovation, but we believe that our procurement processes, both in municipalities and provincial governments and national government, need and a lot of innovation can go into that. And I agree with the previous uh, speaker around alternative building materials. Uh, that, will, th that also speaks to issues of efficiency and uh, ultimately it affects uh, energy consumption in buildings. So um, uh, and a waste uh, solution is uh, at the same time addressing a, an energy issue. But uh, in the interest of time, I'll go straight to the questions that we'd like to pose to the, to the panelists. Uh, so in the spirit of discussion and dialogue, would like uh, the panelists to deliberate on this uh, following issue, especially, especially in relation to the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Program. I got it right this time. Um, um, how do we hold uh, government accountable to implementing policies around green economy in general, but also those that are around renewable energy. If we don't succeed in implementing these programs, who should we hold accountable? Um, should the civil society be involved? In what capacity should they be involved if they are to be involved? So that's, that's, that's one question with about uh, three parts to it, but that's the first question. Uh, and the second question is around what will it take for the state to innovate its procurement processes in line with the point that we uh, I just made earlier. And furthermore, how can we make sure that we mainstream uh, green procurement? And green procurement not only in energy, how do we support these waste pickers, uh, the, the alternative building material, uh, to ensure that we support small and medium enterprises grow uh, through the procurement uh, innovation around our procurement processes? Uh, the third question is, what measures can we be taken to capacitate government departments and especially municipalities to truly implement green economy policies, given that they are the final service deliverers? So from my experience at uh, working as a government uh, vehicle, we get to work very closely with mun municipalities. And what we've uh, noticed, uh, we have a project, so what we've noticed is that uh, the, big, the metros are well capacitated, they they sophisticated in how they yeah they, they implement their, their their programs, but the municipalities are, 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 are you know they they're very weak on capacity. One last quest, uh, question to the panel: What will it take to finalize some of the strategies that have been pending for a while? And they and um, they don't just relate to renewable energy, but we have the gas utilization master plan. Uh, and gas is uh, considered as a transition fuel from coal. Um, the integrated energy plan, the new IRP, and how do we as government ensure that uh, a just transition is indeed just? Thank you very much. Okay, so that's meant to spice it up a bit. So allow me briefly to I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which they're going to speak, and I'm assuming that you will just pass on to each other, that I won't have to jump up each time. Um, up first will be uh, Commissioner Tasneem Esop. Uh, Tasneem has been an MEC in the Western Cape. Um, she is also, she, as I understand it, she headed up the team that wrote Chapter 5 of the NDP. Uh, yes. She then was saying it's all her fault. Um, <laughs> 
personally. Um, <laughs> and um, before that, of course, she was uh, she was an MEC for two terms and in Kasatu uh, prior to that. After her, it'll be Professor Mark Sullen, uh, former head of the school. Uh, I'm proud to say he's currently it's a mouthful. Program Coordinator of the Sustainable Development Program in the School of Public Leadership, the Academic Director of the Sustainability in Institute, and the Co-Director of the Stellenbosch Center for Complex Systems in Transition. He's also put out three books, four books, three in the, in the last few years, which I think is just showing off, actually, Mark. One is just, <laughs> that's just Envy speaking. Just Transitions, Explorations of Sustainability in an Unfair World. Uh, and then in 2015, he did Untamed Urbanisms. And then in 2016, greening the South African economy. Um, so I think we really do have someone with the, with the academic uh, weight coming in. After him, let me get in this right, uh, it's uh, Ntombi Futi Ntuli. Uh, Ntombi uh, used to work, it's important to note that she worked at Ekuruleni uh, for about eight years uh, on energy and climate change before moving uh, to where she is now at the CSIR, which I always get wrong, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research at the Energy Center, where she's a principal researcher uh, on industry business cases. And she is responsible for, for, trans, uh, for translating the Energy Center's research into direct and tangible outcomes for both industry and SMMEs. So someone who really has gone from the local to uh, the center and is working from there. And the last speaker will be uh, Dingus Ikwebu, well known to, to most of us. Uh, he's been head of the education department in NUMSA since uh, 1995. Um, and was uh, in part responsible for the 1998 Energy White Paper that we just heard about uh, a second ago. No, that's ago. too big. <laughs> <laughs> just remember, we hear every mutter you make because your microphone's on. And he is um, he's currently co-director of uh, the Chisimani Center for Activist Education in Cape Town. Uh, and at the end of his term, he'll be going back to NUMSA. Okay, so that'll be your panel. Uh, they've got between 10 and 15 minutes. and about 13 minutes, I'll start waving pieces of paper at them, which they will studiously ignore. Uh, at which point I'll just turn off their microphones. Um, so <laughs> colleagues, try and keep the time if you can. One of them will be using the screen. So here we go. After them, it'll be over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So it's a really a big honor for me to have been invited to participate in this esteemed uh, OR Tambo debate. And so I hope that um, my contribution tonight contributes to uh, the values that uh, our dearest comrade Tambo uh, held dear. So first thing first, I, it is guilty as charged. I did lead the drafting of chapter five. How many of you actually read it, chapter five? Not bad, actually. Normally I get fewer hands yes. than that. Um, so the first thing I, I really want to emphasize about uh, when we're having this conversation, and in some ways I think this is going to be my response to Ivor's uh, input earlier. It's important to note that the starting point in Chapter 5 is that climate change is real, and it is a real danger, and that science has proven that those who are going to be most impacted on by climate change impacts are indeed the poor and the vulnerable in society, period. Two, when dealing with climate change and in the plan itself, you'll see chapter five does that, we have to put the poor and the vulnerable addressing poverty and inequality right at the center of any plans to address climate change in this country and in the world. Now, many things have changed, actually, since that plan was adopted in 2012. Since then, well, the plan talks about the commitments South Africa made in Copenhagen, but since then, Paris happened. And in fact, the South African government made uh, commitments, uh, very clear commitments, when they signed the Paris Agreement. But also, since the adoption of the plan, it was interesting that there were many, 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 many strong changes in the energy space itself, and especially in South Africa. Um, and that renewable energy, when we were drafting the plan, didn't seem 
to be affordable at the time. There were still concerns around the kind of costs of renewable energy in the country. And suddenly, as we all knew, it took a short period of three years for things to really dramatically change. Now, I'm not here to debate with Iva about the feasibility of renewable energy. I, I think we will have our wonderful <laughs> guest from CSI or our panelists to just put down the fact. So I, I, I stand by the fact that we have to shift very strongly and very quickly away from our use of fossil fuels. Not just in South Africa, but in the world. Now, there are conservative, if we can call them conservative, agencies like the International Energy Agency, who has actually said that if the world wants to stay below 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees of global warming, then 80% of current fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground. That's a huge challenge for South Africa given that we are dependent on coal. And that's what Chapter 5 is all about. That we're not saying that South Africa and many developing countries who are still dependent on fossil fuels for its development should shut down their use of fossil fuels tomorrow. And the plan really refers to a just transition. And the center of my argument here tonight is that we urgently need to get to the point of planning this just transition and we're already out of time. The plan envisaged that we would be in the early stages of that just transition planning by 2015. We're in 2017 now. So we, we have missed uh, quite uh, a, an opportunity to get ahead of the game quite quickly. Now, I know that, Ivor, you've said this, um, you know, you don't want to get into doctrinal disputes. I think that's an oversimplification. There's a very important reason why the plan actually does not, Chapter 5 is not called the green economy. And there was a deliberate rationale behind that. The green economy itself, and it has put this on the table and we can debate it, is a contested concept. And when we were drafting this plan, we did not want to get into that contestation. The idea of growth and then calling it green growth is something that we need to debate and discuss because there is some contradiction between trying to promote environmental sustainability and dealing with climate change that is largely uh, caused by our current economic uh, approaches our current production and consumption patterns, we are in this situation because of that. And so this endless idea that, sorry, the idea that growth is going to be endless, that it is unlimited, is something that we all need to discuss. We do need our economies to grow, but the nature of that growth is going to be important. The content of that growth is going to be important. And many, as, many who have critiqued the green economy concept basically concerned about the fact that a green economy concept in a narrow sense of its uh, uh, approach would mean that we're talking about green growth, in other words, greening existing, if you want to put an ism to this, existing capitalism. So basically greenwashing already flawed economic systems and approaches. Let's have that debate. So I want to make the point that the title of chapter five talks about promoting environmental sustainability and equitable, the equitable transition to a low carbon economy and society. Because the kind of transition we are going to need to respond to these multiple crises that we're facing in the world, poverty, inequality, environmental degradation, climate change, etc., would require massive and scaled up transformations of our economies and our society. And that holds true for South Africa as well. So to do that, one cannot be incremental, which makes 
the need for getting all players, all social partners in the country together to start planning for that just transition so that we can manage it in a proactive way rather than being hit in the face by crises that we then come out with short-term solutions for is really, really important. So that's um, the other point that I want to make, that for the just transition to happen, we need to have a planned approach to this. And all social partners, all of society, need to be engaged in this. This is not something that will happen in a top-down way where government will decide what that transition will look like. This is all of us that need to, uh, to be engaged, which, of course, means it's absolutely complex. Nobody is arguing, and certainly not that chapter, that a just transition is going to be a walk in the park. In fact, they are going to be winners and they are going to be losers. And as soon as we can identify that and understand the implications, the easier, or maybe not easier, but the, uh, the better we are in terms of preparation for it and to deal with it. So for example, and I'm not sure what my time looks like, <coughs> a very, very concrete example of how, if we do not sit around the table and plan for the just transition, can make things go really badly was the current ESCOM um, <coughs> announcement of the closure of the coal-fired power. Excuse me. So ESCOM went ahead and announced this publicly. And of course, the response from Labour, and Dinga, I'm sure you're going to pick this up, <coughs> was an immediate counter-reaction. ESCOM blamed renewable energy for the closure of those coal-fired power plants, which was a really mischievous way of actually, uh, you know, playing with the truth. And, and they got what they wanted. They got a reaction from the unions who have to, workers have to defend their jobs. Now, the workers have taken a position, which is a bit um, worrying, that is anti-renewable energy, and they see renewable energy as the enemy, and now are fighting in defense of coal which is fascinating, <coughs> for the movement that actually came out with the concept of just transition. <coughs> if the unions had said, which they should have, we need to get to the negotiating table and sit down and plan this transition away from coal, it would have been a completely different ballgame altogether. So that is a concrete example if we do not get to the table and negotiate and plan for this just transition. <coughs> the last point I want to make, sorry, and I'm, I'm not sure why, it's the Joburg weather maybe. <laughs> that, <coughs> as, as I said, this is a, a massive transformation, so we cannot get into just purely an approach to the green economy that talks about this sector is going to be good for the green economy. We should look at that sector, whether it's waste, whether it's energy, whether it cannot just purely be an economic sectoral approach. That what we are going to have to look at is wide systems change. And one of the important principles, and maybe people have missed this, it's the one thing that bothers me the most, and especially that Treasury is not driving this quite strongly, and maybe the, tri uh, the, the private sector will. Chapter 5 identifies a number of principles that were in fact negotiated with all four social partners during the drafting of the plan. And it's fascinating to know that government, business, labor, and civil society agreed to these principles, but the one that jumps out to mind is the one that I think would have far-reaching systemic impacts if we actually started implementing that. And that is the principle that says we have to move to full cost accounting in this country. That we have to start internalizing the externalities. Now, if we started doing that, <coughs> all the debates about this is going to cost too much and that is going to cost too much and, uh, you know, will be put into context. And therefore, either the issue of um, renewables being too costly and we shouldn't waste our money would come into a much more robust debate if we did actually look at the full cost of all of our energy uh, sources and energy use in the country. I know my time is up and I'm hoping that we'll get another chance at this debate, but I thought I'd share those 
I've got three minutes now, I'll be fair. I'll stop there, and uh, I do have quite a bit more to, to get into the debate about, but I thought I'd just highlight some of those issues. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here in this, in this auditorium, which I helped build. <laughs> um, so I'm going to engage directly with Iva, um, <laughs> and you can call it what you want, <laughs> and we'll do it here in front of everybody else. Iva's argument sounds logical, because we've heard it often before, but the empirical evidence for virtually every single one of his points on renewable energy in particular does not exist. And I'm absolutely convinced of that. And I will refer to some of the evidence. And I'm sure the CSIR will elaborate. But more importantly, his argument rests on a 20th century conception of political economy, which is out of date and highly, highly misleading. And his argument about the costs of climate change is also 1990s. So we've heard these arguments before. Luddites said machines were too expensive and will set us back. We can't afford it. In the 1980s, people said IT is too expensive. It's going to be horrendously complex to restructure. Why would we invest in stuff which, which took, and the, knowing that the, that the learning curves are so steep that in five years' time it's all going to be out of date? Imagine if we had listened to those people. Where would we be today? So here are some of the numbers. Investment in renewable energy since globally since 2009 has exceeded investments in fossil fuels every single year despite the drop in the oil prices. Renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels in 60 countries around the world. The cost of renewable energy in South Africa now, according to CSR work and the updated work uh, by the guy who, uh, in my view, was forced to leave uh, the CSR, uh, suggests that the cost of renewables are 50%, not suggests, I think clearly uh, demonstrates the cost of renewables are 50% of the costs of fossil fuels, in particular coal, and it's even more serious when compared to nuclear. So why on earth would you invest in a more expensive primary energy source if the empirical evidence shows that over the life cycle, not current costs, which is what kind of confused people who run ESCOM tend to focus on, but the cost over the life cycle of the entire plant uh, is much more, much, much cheaper over the life cycle. And after all, I mean, did Madupi come in on, on budget and on time? Wasn't the initial price 75 billion? Isn't it going to be 300 billion now? Show me a renewable energy plant that has not come in on budget, not come in on time, and with very little corruption. If you want a corrupt economy, support nuclear, sure. Uh, let's not talk about another few coal-fired power plants at, the, at exactly the moment when our coal deposits are declining in quality. Innovation, innovation is in South Africa, even for the short four-year period when we have had one of the fastest growing renewable energy sectors in the world, actually did take off. And industrialization, even in that very short space of time, did take off, and all the evidence suggests that could have taken off much more significantly. And my research students have researched this to death. So I can't hear an argument that says there wouldn't have been new value chains. It would have defied the logic of the way the 21st century political economy actually works. But never mind all of that. Let's just look at our traditional coal economy. What's happening there? Do you know that we built coal-fired power stations specified to use low-grade coal, which is why we have very high CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour. Why did we do that? Very simple. We wanted to export the high-grade coal, mainly to the industrialized countries, who would pay a premium for that high-grade coal, and we used those surpluses to cross-subsidize the rest of the coal economy. Now that the world has changed and the rise of the BRICS, we are exporting to Asia and Latin America. What coal do they want? They want low-grade coal. 
<laughs> so we have a rising price of low-grade coal at the time when our high-grade coal is starting to, de 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 to, to deteriorate. And if you look at the amount of coal that we burn per kilowatt hour now over the last 10 years, it's in, it's in decline. In other words, we need more and more coal uh, to generate a, a kilowatt hour uh, of, of, of energy. Why continue to invest in that? Why continue to, to, to pretend that this is the route out of our uh, development challenges? We have a buildup of surpluses of coal now that ESCOM is refusing to buy. Why is that? Well, the initial IRP predicted that as economic growth is go goes up, we are also going to need more and more energy, despite the fact that ESCOM is in massively increasing the cost of energy. Hey, lo and behold, they didn't understand elasticities. And because of that, they didn't realize there would be energy efficiencies. And some of the biggest uh, users would make very sound financial decisions to get to, to supplement the unreliable grid by investing in what? The cheap energy source, which is renewables. But forget about coal. Look at oil. There is something in sustainability economics, in, the, in, in other words, if, in, if you like, in 21st century political economy, called energy return on energy invested. Energy return on energy invested is the amount of energy you need to generate the energy that you need. Uh, and so if you just look at oil, in the 1930s, to generate 100 barrels of oil, to get 100 barrels of oil out of the ground, you needed one barrel of oil to do all the activities that you needed to do in order to get the 100 out of the ground. In other words, the, the energy return on energy invested ratio in the 1930s was 1 to 100. It's now 1 to 10. And that is a key driver. So it's not about oil peak and running out of oil. You know, I don't, I don't buy that kind of. So it's almost it's peak supply rather, it's peak demand rather than peak supply because the prices have to be a certain level uh, in order to be able to generate uh, 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 the amount of coal uh, energy uh, oil that you need to sustain the global economy when your ratio is one to ten. <clears throat> Why depend on that? Because the bottom line is that in order to get that stuff out of the ground, you need prices that are high. As soon as prices go high, it destroys what we understand to be growth. As soon as we, as soon as we knock growth rates down, uh, demand, demand drops, investments cut out, but as soon as we start picking up again, prices pick up, and we go into this highly unstable oil prices and economic growth, and we bump along the bottom. Is this, the what, is this what we should look forward to when we have one of the most unequal uh, societies in the world, and we seriously do need economic growth that is inclusive. Is this is how do we, do we want to run our economy on coal and oil in those kinds of contexts? Never mind nuclear. Okay. Coming to the climate change uh, argument that we only contribute to a small proportion of, of climate change. Our contribution to climate change should, is, is actually irrelevant when it comes to making economic decisions. To focus on climate change and the science of climate change for doing anything at the moment needs to be complemented by needs to be complemented by 21st century political economy which takes into account all the economic drivers that I have been referring to including the, de the rapid decline in renewable energy prices the volatility of oil prices and the political economy of coal uh, which has got a very limited future it's in that context that we need to really face the challenges that we face now in South Africa. In my view, in the, 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 in the Becky era, we had corporate restructuring driven by financialization, BE and <coughs> shareholder value, and economic policy, which was hands-offish, free marketeer kind of economics, was completely and utterly inappropriate for what was actually going on in the real economy. So we did not have investment in the productive economy. During the Mbeki era, we've shifted to a dependence on the state-owned enterprises, massive capital budgets in massive infrastructures, which if it had worked, might not have been too bad, but it wouldn't have created a lot of jobs. In the event, it's what causes state capture, because it got corrupted. So what's the next, what's the post-Zuma era? What is the post-Zuma economic policy? Is it going to be the replication of the mineral energy complex, which is essentially what the consequences are of Ivor's argument? Or are we really going to diversify? And if we're going to diversify, which energy source do we choose? Surely it's very simpler. The cheapest one, irrespective of the consequences for climate change. <coughs> uh, 
it just happens to be good for climate change, which means we can access all sorts of cash floating around in global funds, which just happen to be the kinds of cash we do need if we do want to subsidize our sources of energy. Watch the space, because the subsidies on fossil fuels are going to rapidly start declining, and we benefit from those. I mean, what's the sensible economic choice here? So I agree with Kabisi Jonas that we need a new economic consensus in the post-Zuma era. And at the center of that must be investment-led, job-creating, livelihood-creating growth. For the first time since 94, we need investment-led growth. And at the center of that, in my view, should be investment in an energy source that is the cheapest, has got the best backward and forward linkages in the economy in terms of value chains, and has the greatest potential for innovation. Because it's really innovation and brains in the world that we currently live in that determines our future trajectories in an information-based uh, global economy. Apartheid was about white cash and black bodies. Not much has changed since then. If we're going to change things, we need an investment-led, innovation-based, job-creating, livelihood-creating uh, economy. And if we don't change our energy, our, our fundamental change in the energy base of our economy to the cheapest one possible with the greatest for backwards and forwards linkages, hey, that's renewable energy, by the way, uh, we're not going to make it. One last comment on our renewable energy program. I think we got it wrong. In a very short space of time, yes, we had massive escalations up to over 200 billion rand, roughly 5% of our GDP has gone into renewable energy. 30% of it from is FDI, and it mocked up a lot of uh, cash sloshing around in financial institutions because of state guarantees. That's the way to do things. However, we handed the whole thing over to the multinational corporations who are building uh, renewable energy power plants in, uh, in, in, in 100, uh, over what, 102 locations all around the country, mainly in small towns, when in fact we could have had much greater public and social control of these renewable energy infrastructures as the basis of building a new politics of local participatory democracy. Yeah. Coal was the basis for social democracy because coal created the industrial unions, which then became the basis of social democratic parties that got elected after the Second World War. Maggie Thatcher comes in, smashes the unions, closes the coal mines, rise of oil, liberalization, globalization. What's the politics of renewable energy? It's local participatory democracy, what Tasnim calls energy democracy. The potential for this technology within the local economies, with financial flows that are not connected to international financial markets is extraordinary. We've proven this technology in our own context. Now we have to get the institutional configurations right as the basis for a renewed democracy. And those will sit at the very center of a post-Zuma economic policy. I'm afraid, Ivor, you your, your argument against that way of understanding 21st century political economy will not equip us for, for dealing with the challenges that we face, both within our country and to position ourselves as a front-end leader of what's what is coming in the 21st century. Because there's absolutely no doubt where the rest of the world is going. Do we really want to miss the boat? Thank you.
So I was saying, when I was flipping through the newspaper yesterday, um, I came across an article on National Development Plan, and the interesting statement being made there was most people who criticize the National Development Plan have actually never read it or haven't read much of it. <laughs> but I know we don't have such problems in the room because I know all of you have read it and you know it like the palm of your hand. <laughs> and that is why we're going to have a robust debate after this presentation. So uh, after the couple of speakers have put their positions, it's very difficult to try and not duplicate what has already been said, but um, the presentation is all about looking at how does renewable energy respond to the National Development Plan. Um, as you have read the National Development Plan, you would know that um, there's a couple of outcomes that need to be realized um, at the end of the implementation period of the NDP. Most of those outcomes talk directly or indirectly to implementation of renewable energy or green economy and implementation of green economy. So, actually this is can do this, yeah, much better. So, um, if you look at the different outcomes of the National Development Plan, at the core of it all is outcome six, and it talks about an efficient, competitive, responsive economic infrastructure network. And out of that, it says we need to establish coordination, planning, integration, and monitoring of um, strategic infrastructure projects. Uh, when you look at the list of strategic infrastructure projects, uh, SIP 8 talks directly to green energy in support of the South African economy. So for me, this is the basis for establishment of the renewable energy base in South Africa. And um, so all the other outcomes in the National Development Plan needs to talk to that. So a couple of speakers have spoken a lot about the benefits of renewable energy, but I think what I'm going to present is the numbers um, of how renewable energy has actually contributed to the South African economy. Outcome four uh, talks to employment. How is this program creating employment in the South African economy, uh, employment opportunities, for previously disadvantaged or historically excluded population groups. It talks about skills, as how are we developing skills to make sure that we, we meet the demand um, of new, perhaps high-tech skills that are required in the renewable energy program. Um, outcome seven talks to um, rural uh, communities and how this program is contributing to um, sustainable rural communities. And of course, that also talks to how do you create employment and jobs for rural communities. Um, outcome eight, sustainable human settlements. I'm going to talk more about that and how all these achievements in the program link up to this couple of outcomes. Outcome 10 uh, talks to protecting and enhancing environmental assets and natural resources. Uh, that's about reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we know about the commitment made by South Africa of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 34% beyond business as usual by 2025. So how is this program contributing to that? Uh, creating a better South Africa and contributing to a better and safer Af Afri South Africa in a better world. So how do we increase uh, the foreign direct investment from... Um, from um, 40 billion in 2013 to about 230 billion in 2019. And lastly, outcome 14 talks, talks about nation building and social cohesion. 
how does this program ensure that we deal with um, incorporating into the economic activities people with disabilities, gender equality, um, creating equal opportunities for all population groups and address the inequality issues. So, um, when we look at outcome six, as it is, it talks about implement infrastructure projects. So what has happened up to so far? In 2010, uh, we had the integrated resource plan, uh, which um, said we are going to develop projects and add into the South African power system 17.8 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. So what happened after that, government started the I renewable energy IPP procurement program um, and the procurement program uh, is then led by the ministerial determination that says this is how much we are going to procure over this period of time. So the combined ministerial determinations have given us about 14.2 gigawatts of renewable energy to be procured up to 2019. Um, from 2011, when the IPP program started up to now, uh, the amount of energy that has been procured is 6.3 gigawatts and the projects that have been built completed and are currently feeding into the grid amount to about 3 gigawatts. And then when we talk to investments, um, what have we achieved? Uh, we've, we've had a, a, a 200 billion number being thrown around by a couple of presenters. Yes, that is what the program has achieved in total, but if you break that down, from which technologies is this 200 billion coming from? It's coming from wind energy, 74 billion. 67 is coming from solar PV. 88 is coming from CSP and, um, and um, hydro, bio, and waste technologies contributing 1 billion and biomass about 2.8. So we are talking, um, addressing economic inequality, we are talking about redressing um, the inequalities of the past, and how is this program contributing to all those things, and how is it contributing to the South African economy? So out of the 200 billion that has been invest invested, um, about 67 billion was allocated to procuring local content, it was very interesting in the first position paper to hear that um, there is no local manufacturing that could be created through renewable energy. Um, I was just shocked because <laughs> I used to work for the DTI and we were driving localization and setting up of local manufacturing facilities and we did actually see some investment being um, attracted into the South African economy. And maybe to quote and number, I think that would go up to uh, 1 billion rand being invested into the South African economy through local manufacturing facilities in the country for solar PV and wind energy. Foreign direct investment, um, about uh, 48 billion, um, and that's about 30% of the total invested as we have had before. Very important is social economic development, um, which uh, talks, to, talks to the outcomes that uh, the National Development Plan <coughs> wants to achieve. Um, about 298 million has been invested in that. And that um, comes in the form of local community ownership of renewable energy projects. So local communities where projects are being built um, have uh, ownership shares in the projects and are going to see value being created and investment being made in their areas. So very important um, to address these issues that we've been talking about. <laughs> Enterprise development is another uh, that has received about 94 million uh, investment uh, through the IPP procurement program. And um, this talks to small business development. How does a program incorporate um, small businesses in the communities uh, where projects are being built or broadly within South Africa and what is the value that is being added. And that goes a long way because 
if you look at uh, the economic impact, you look at direct impact, indirect impact, and even induced impact. And those communities, when they start earning income from these projects, they start spending money, and that stimulates the rural economy. Uh, just a quick snapshot. I hope. Okay. Okay, technology is failing me here. I'm going to try. I'm sorry. flipping through the slides, but it's not changing on the screen. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hmm. okay. That's why I'm here. Just talk to the Yeah, so um, imports and exports. Uh, is another area that has been stimulated through the procurement of renewable energy in South Africa. Uh, we've seen, oh, great, thank you. <laughs> we've seen um, quite a big numbers of um, um, equipment being imported in South Africa. We did this quick analysis uh, based on the data from uh, East Data, and we found that um, for solar PV, up to about 4 billion of uh, equipment has been procured and that stimulates the economy. But as I spoke earlier on about the localization and setting up of local manufacturing facilities and that should stimulate the export, that should stimulate the exports. And you can see uh, in, in the solar PV that the exports are actually growing up. And, but uh, somebody spoke earlier on about um, how the program has stalled and that has affected the South African economy especially there's been a couple of disinvestments in manufacturing facilities and those are some of the things that needs to be addressed. Um, job creation. Um, I, um, there isn't much I can say about this because a lot of speakers have said a lot about the number of jobs that have been created, but just to focus on this slide, um, there's 30,000 jobs that have been created through the program. Um, most of the jobs are for South African citizens, but most importantly, uh, from local communities. And we're talking about rural communities where these projects are being developed and um, the, the, the stimulus that you get in the economy. And that will be my last slide. <laughs> um, CO2 emission reduction is also one of the areas being touched on in the National Development Plan. And how is the green, con green energy implementation uh, responding to CO2 emission reduction. Uh, this is the number that uh, came out of the IPP office report. Um, uh, based on the projects that have been uh, procured, uh, we're going to get 20 uh, million tons of CO2 being reduced. But from the projects that are currently online and have been implemented, we've currently achieved about 6.3 metric tons of CO2 being reduced. So these are all the impacts that talk to the National Development Plan. And um, yeah, that's it. All right, uh, the challenges of being the last uh, panelist. Um, as uh, I was introduced, uh, I come from uh, the Metal Workers Union NUMSA, historically, and as a union, we organize workers in a, an energy intensive sector, uh, smelters, uh, foundries, and uh, car assemblers. And I just wanted to say to, to Ivo, in 2012, after immense discussion in the union, the members of the union agreed to set aside from their pension fund one billion to support the renewable energy uh, uh, program. And they agreed also that uh, the transition that was being spoken about was necessary for themselves, their communities, and their children. They also even went further 
to say that uh, the green uh, the house uh, gas emissions that come from their plants must be taxed and they supported the carbon tax. Now, I don't think that uh, the members were either mad. They understood that uh, if there is global warming and the consequences of this, it will be ordinary people who will be affected. The people who live on the Cape Flats realize that if sea levels rise, it will affect all the people who live in the Cape Flats because the rich have situated themselves in the mountains and, and they will not be affected. So, so I think that ordinary people understood maybe not the entire science of climate change, but they understood how this affected them. So there was a, an, an understanding of how them getting involved and supporting the transition to a low carbon economy was in their own interest and the interest of their, of their, of their, of their communities. So I do think that uh, uh, if we look back to what I call the period of 2011-2012, this was an important moment where different sectors in South African society came together to support the idea of a transition to a, a low carbon economy. And, and, and I think that it's important to realize uh, this uh, what I call emergence, uh, convergence. And, and I, I don't have the time to, to go through how different unions, how different federations in this country supported the idea of a, a, a just transition. Now, there were differences about the architecture in this aspect and that aspect, but people thought that uh, this was an important move uh, to be endorsed by the different stakeholders in, 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 in society. Now, Besides the issue of a, a, a being a just cause, also our members understood how economically it made sense. And, 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 and some of the, to just give it sort of an example, I mean, I don't understand uh, where people say that there, there wasn't a capacity. We realized, for instance, we took solar water uh, the heating systems. We went and identified what capacity existed in the country and I can mention Quickcourt, I can mention GW Giza, all these companies, we did a scoping of those and said that with certain instruments that DTI must put in place, like designation using the procurement policies, we will be able to create, 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 create jobs. So I think that we had, as a country, something going in these different partners coming together and supporting uh, the, the, the transition. But I mean, if we fast forward now, if we fast forward five years down the line after this moment of 2011, 2012, people have spoken on the panel about how the program on renewable energy has stalled. As I sit here, a number of uh, discussions are happening about companies that are closing. Today, a company, a Chinese company called Jinko Solar Panels in Cape Town is negotiating today retrenchments. And this is a direct result of some of the stalling in the, in the, in the program. And that all the potential that we had sort of identified, I won't uh, talk about the one billion that our members invested, is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is being wasted because of some of the, uh, what are called the sort of policy uh, uncertainty bickering and and, uh, uh, and and what has happened to the to the to the program? I mean, when I look back, I mean, clearly this wasn't a a, a a cornerstone of the program, but a lot of people in this country, when there was a talk about the solar water heater program, <coughs> uh, you know, they felt it wasn't going to sort of a, a, a it, it was a a social justice for those people who were living in RTP houses. But for two years, we have not installed a, a Giza. The program has also stalled. It has also stalled. So I think that the moment that was there in 2011 and 2012 has somehow been a, a, a squander. And I think that, uh, uh, Mark, if we're going to talk about uh, the post-post, we need to say, look, 
what went wrong. And I think that uh, for me, there are three uh, reasons that I just want to highlight about uh, why what was a program that was emerging, there was the emerging consensus, consensus around it, um, has uh, somehow uh, uh, become a bit unhinged. The first uh, reason is that uh, we underestimated the power of what I call vested interests. We underestimated how vested interests will act against this program. The second one is that maybe it's related to this. There was a, despite having written a book on a just transition, maybe there was a, in society, a shallow understanding of the transition itself. And a, a consequence of that was the sort of optimism that accompanied, you know, we were all moving and we were all agreed and we were all together in this. Um, the third thing uh, uh, is that, uh, may, and we, we as a union spoke, wrote, made submission about the incorrectness of the architecture of the program. Um, let me just go through all these three and then I'll, 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 I'll keep quiet. If we take sort of a vested interest, if we take sort of a vested interest, at the same time, there was a discussion at a policy level about establishing what is called an independent systems market operator, mm. ISMO. Mm -hmm. And that idea, you know, for people who are not uh, involved in this energy policy, meant that uh, the question of uh, what gets onto the grid, at which point, and dispatching and all of that could not be left to ESCOM. You had to have an independent ma uh, systems market operator. We went there as a union, supported the idea of a establishment of ISMO. As we see today, and I can say this, ESCOM sank the bill. And, and what I'm, I'm trying to show is how vested interests at every point have been sort of stacked against, against the, the transition. Carbon tax. A lot of discussion, discussion papers from Treasury. And I can say here, not only did the, some of these companies, Acelo Metal, queue outside of our offices so that we must be opposed as a union to the idea of the carbon tax. They told their members in the different plants that your union seems to be supporting the carbon tax and this is going to lead to job losses. Sheer blackmail. Sheer blackmail. And this is how vested interest... And I, I, I can go on. But for me, what's important, what maybe we didn't understand, is how like a company, a state-owned entity like ESCO, is part of this, what I call this sort of fossil fuel complex, and how it has been quite instrumental in, uh, in sort of thwarting some of, uh, of, 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 of this. I think some people spoke about what happened uh, to the closure of the, uh, the, SNIM, uh, the six power station. The inquiry that's starting tomorrow, the Portfolio Committee on Public Enterprises, one of the things that they are wanting to investigate is how ESCOM got unions and the Coal Truckers Forum in Pumalang and incited them against renewables. I'm talking about people from my union and gave them wrong graphs and wrong statistics so that they can come out against this. This is all, listen to what's happening in this week. This is what uh, the, the, the Portfolio Committee is investigating at, at the moment. Can we be accused of uh, a maligning people who say, look, vested interests have thwarted the program? ESCOM is a, is a, is a good example of, uh, of, of this. The second uh, 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 reason, uh, I, I do think that uh, although uh, we sometimes speak about the mineral energy complex in South Africa, when we started talking about this uh, transition, how deep and rooted, uh, not, not just uh, economically, but also in terms of uh, sort of what I call sort of social networks. Um, um, and uh, hopefully this will come up about uh, how the coal uh, uh, trackers forum are somehow 
bankrolling some of the provinces of the ANC in Pumalanga. And then therefore, when, when people say, look, you know, we, we're not sure about whether this is, you know, it's going to go forward and mustn't go forward. Clearly, the, the, the interests are, 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 are at play. The last uh, point, which is my third point about uh, why uh, we've, we've had uh, this, uh, uh, I think, rolling back of, of the program, is, uh, I think, what Mark uh, spoke about, uh, uh, the sort of uh, RI triple P program uh, was uh, based on, uh, you know, giving all of this to multinational corporations. There was exclusion of other state organs. The, the notions of uh, municipal and uh, subnational levels getting involved in this were all excluded, mm -hmm. and 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 when we came up that what we needed here is a, a a socially owned renewable energy sector which would involve local communities, cooperatives, community uh, energy parks, and a, and a, an, an array of uh, other forms uh, of uh, of energy ownership. Uh, this uh, we were, they thought that we were crazy. And I think that uh, the architecture uh, has, uh, is, is what is leading to the sort of unraveling. And, and I think that if we want to go forward, we've got to learn all the lessons. Yes, we've got to learn all the lessons so that uh, if we're the other windows are, are, are sort of uh, being opened, we are able to rectify some of this. Yeah. So I think that uh, for me, that's, that's important. Yeah. yeah. Okay, colleagues, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I'm reasonably sure Ivor would like to reply at some point. Um, I should say that we did, uh, I think, uh, well, lead open by saying this is a safe space for a robust engagement, and it is, so let's not entirely personalise this around Ivor, but I will, I will take your hand, don't worry. Uh, but I think I'd like to add one fourth uh, dimension, which is kind of benign neglect and an assumption that leadership understands these arguments and follows it. So, for example, Mark and I and a whole bunch of others in, I don't know when, 2008 or nine, were asked by the MEC in Gauteng to write this entire sustainability transition for Gauteng. And we, ended, we, were, we, we worked right through Christmas and New Year because he said he wanted it in the first week of the New Year. And it was this fact document with UCT and Stellenbosch and ourselves and all sorts of other people. And he kind of went, mm, yeah, I'm sort of persuaded. And then he got rotated. It was a new MEC. And the new MEC said, I, I, I want my own one. I don't want that one. Give me another one. And we said, no, we've had enough, thank you. And then it never happened. Yeah. And the assumption that you found the truth and that everyone is automatically going to do what's right because it's in the interests of everyone, I think... If we haven't learned that that's misplaced idealism, uh, we probably never will. Anyway, enough lectures from me. Uh, I can see there are some people in the room. I see Mike Muller, I think, has slipped out. No, he's not. There he is. Good. <laughs> that's what I like to see, one of the National Planning Commissioners and others. So, audience, I am going to take Ivor, but I'm going to take you as, a, as along with some others. So, can I start here, and I'm going to work my way that way. So, Mike at the back, and then I'm going to go in the middle. Anyone? That's standing with a the microphone. There. Okay, we'll start with those three. Mike, your second. Since, since I've got the mic, oh no, I thought I had it first. Uh, no, you're first down here at the front, and then Mike. You both got microphones. Uh, uh, yes, you got the mic, or you, what's it? Mike yeah. has a mic, and you have a mic. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, one of the things that uh, we would like, uh, and I say we, we are not saying I. Because this is a major difference, to say we and not I. Uh, we want to thank you all to have courage. Because what is uh, happening in political economy is a lack of courage. And uh, thank you particularly the panel, but also Mr. Ivor. He's got the courage to defend his ideas, which is not a bad thing. As long as the ideas are good for people. Now we are to introduce ourselves with a national program uh, at COCTA. You know, COCTA is a DCOG. And we are implementing the S Sustainable Development Goals in all municipalities through cooperatives and municipal local economic development. It's a hard task, very, very hard task, 
because there is no academics, there is no people who can actually understand anything of what we're talking about. So we are doing an incredible exercise here who is not actually penetrating the communities, the civil society, the municipalities, the taxpayers' association, people who survive, etc. So this exercise must be courageously go down and spend some time in a shack for a week or two to understand exactly how it's happened. Because unless you go and experience this, it's not going to happen. Two, the language is incredible. You are absolutely in an orthodoxy. Uh, first, the green economy is fine. Okay? Everybody knows what Tasnim said and uh, Mark and everybody. The, econ the green economy is a term invented by the vested interest in order for us to go in the same direction. And everybody knows that's not a polichinel secret. But when your own language is failing you, it is very important for us to start to look at the academics, starting to change the language. And I'm going to just be very simple, because I'm going to take what it was said and just say it. For example, you talk about debate. One person only spoke about dialogue. Dialogue is cooperation, debate is competitive. Two, transition. We're talking about transition. We don't need transition. We need shift. Shift in consciousness, not just transition. When we're talking about the central, the centralized, like, you know, nuclear, this, ESCOM, etc. Who talks about decentralized? Municipalities are decentralized. There are millions of people who can take one little wind energy on their roof and whatever they produce, they can even manufacture it themselves. It's proven. Detroit done it, done it as well. And then also, we are not looking at who Tasnim was saying, the oppressed people, or it's a bit of an activist maybe term, but oppressed people, are two people, yes, two. Indigenous people, which are the people in the rural areas with culture, etc., and two, women. If you make those two groups the actors of change, because they are the one who needs the most changes, we are entering into a social, not development, uh, what do you say, Tasnim? Energy democracy. Because the first energy okay. is the type of source is photosynthesis, not photovoltaic. Photosynthesis is done by nature. You don't have to do it yourself. And the second one, once the, the energy has been consumed, it's called rotting. So you put your carbon, you rot it, you put it in the ground and it works. You don't have to do much. You don't need much skills. So we have to rethink completely the way we are not only thinking, the way we are being. And that is one of the things that we wanted to uh, share with you, uh, with a bad language, by the way. Uh, not bad, but uh, not, not well expressed. Thank you. Mike, okay. Mike two, two, mic? two very quick uh, points. First, I'm really distressed that in the papers and actually in the discussion, one would think that South Africa exists on an island somewhere far away from anywhere else. We live in a region, we've got huge inter interdependencies. And uh, the region is terribly affected by what happens in South Africa, but also has a tremendous amount to offer. And if we're going to work simply as South Africa, uh, cut off from the region, um, we'll miss the point. Just last month in Mozambique, there was a discussion about how uh, South Africa and ESCOM in particular is destroying energy planning in the region. First, they created a huge shortage in 2008. And now they're dumping coal-fired electricity and blocking plans for, amongst other things, renewable development in the region. We really need to understand what happens in our neighborhood. Second point, we're talking a lot about innovation and what we could do and what we should do. We don't seem to understand. The other word that's missing in the two papers is energy storage. Our pumped storage in South Africa, thanks to ESCOM, puts us in number, about 10th in the world in terms of size of projects and proportion of the storage to actual energy generation. 
we're really good at this technology, which everybody is panicking about, and they want to know where the lithium's going to come from and all the rest of it. We're producing stored energy at about 80% efficiency, and we don't seem to know it. In fact, we regard it as one of ESCOM's disasters. But energy storage is key to the transition. So we're doing it, but in this whole discussion of transition, we don't seem to notice it. And that worries me, because it says we're dealing with very complex problems, but we're keeping them simple, and that means we're probably not getting down to the key issues. Thank you. There was the hand. There, sir in the middle. Thomas, I'm going to come to this side second, okay? But I'll go to Ivor as my last speaker, and then we'll take the panel's response. My name please is. Please do introduce yourself to us, sir. My name is Sizu. I'm a, I'm a student here at Advert, but I've got an interest in green economy and, and climate change as well. My question is about adaptation to climate change. Um, it's, it's difficult to have a conversation about the green economy without talking about climate change related issues. There's been reference to the NDP, there's been reference to the Copenhagen commitments, um, and I think the time left between now and the achievement of those is between 8 and 13 years, respectively, if I'm not mistaken. South African contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is relevant, 2%, right? Almost similar to how much you're going to get in terms of economic growth in South Africa if we're lucky, 2% this year. What I think is missing is that in the conversation is about how do we use, um, how do we commercialize the climate change adaptation uh, opportunities and how can the green economy opportunities be best leveraged so that we can be able to commercialize, like, to commercialize those. Because the people who are going to be disproportionately impacted by climate change will be the developing countries, particularly the poor. I think the last speaker made reference to, you know, the hierarchy in, in Cape Town, low-lying areas and what have you. So it's how, how does the adaptation discussion come into, into being here? Okay, and lastly, I'll take the much maligned Ivor Sarakinsky. Well, now I know how Galileo felt when he was excommunicated <laughs> by the Catholic Church. Modest. And closer to home, uh, Baruch Spinoza, when the Jewish community of Amsterdam excommunicated him. It's very hard to say things to a group of believers. Uh, the rational, critical capacities tend to get dulled. So let me make a public <laughs> confession, Maoist style. I am not a climate change denialist. I accept all of that. I think that uh, in addressing a whole range of issues that flow out of that, we've been overly optimistic. We think that planning can solve problems, and in a complex environment, you don't know what's happening in the future. And I think in South Africa, we've been caught quite short in terms of our whole policy framework, in terms of adaptation and mitigation. Why do I say this? I say it because I was in there. I was part of the NEDLAC delegation representing government that negotiated with business and trade unions on the climate change white paper. So I know the debates. I was an official in government driving green economy initiatives in collaboration with DTI and other stakeholder departments. It's not that easy. We were very, very optimistic about uh, what we could achieve, and we misunderstood a whole range of issues. In terms of the renewable energy, it is of great significance that China, I'm glad it was mentioned, has canceled an investment in a solar PV plant in South Africa. It was supposed to be a flagship plant. And we need to ask the question, why did they cancel that? And we need answers to that. In terms of solar water heaters, of course there were stakeholders and vested interests. The most powerful vested interest was actually the South African Bureau of Standards, who insisted on having quality criteria for components, not for systems, which pushed the costs up of solar water heaters to a point where they became uh, not, not viable in terms of, 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 of installation uh, opportunities. So, so yes, there are a whole range of complexities there. 
Uh, the one speaker spoke about storage and mentioned the two papers, but it's clear that he hadn't read mine, um, because I do talk about storage. So and I make the point mind. that renewable energy has a major failure, and that is storage. Yes, hot molten salts and all of that. It's not good enough. So in terms of a general point here, uh, I'm not against innovation. I'm not against new technologies. I'm saying that there is a limit to the current technologies that we have, and I don't think we should reify them and see these as the optimal solution. I think we should look forward and look at other technologies that are possibly coming on stream that will be significantly more beneficial uh, to, to South Africa and, and, and the region going forward. Uh, a final point, what is uh, political economy of the 21st century? I, I've seen a definition that says something to the effect Political economists are sociologists who haven't read economics. Uh, and I think that uh, that definition has some validity here. Uh, when you're talking hard finance and hard numbers in terms of driving investment, you've got to look at these difficult questions. And the real, the real situation is that South Africa has come out wanting. We, 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 we talk about 200 billion of investment. How much of that has trickled down to real people, communities on the ground. Well, the studies are out there on the community consortiums, and colleagues here will know more about this than me. They don't work. It's all dummies and, and game playing by the investors who have to cut their finance so fine in terms of the competitive procurement process. So we, we've, we've got a whole range of, 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 of things uh, quite horribly wrong there. One last um, point. No. No, you'll have more chances. No, there's just one last. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was crucified. So, uh, <laughs> no. Least, you and Galileo are both. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, there are vested interests, but what, what is one of the major obstacles to rolling out microgrids, local energy renewable generation processes? It's not conspiracies of evil capitalists who want to stop this. It's not people who believe in the minerals energy complex. It's actually much simpler. It's municipal finance, which needs a third of its operation budgets from on selling electricity. They have an interest in not enabling a whole range of these initiatives. So it's a regulatory policy issue that needs to be addressed. And it really does come down to a simple thing like that. So sometimes it's good to be simple, Occam's razor, cut through the nonsense, cut through the emotions, get down to the issues that can be solved. That's how you deal with wicked problems. That's how you deal with complex environments where you don't know the outcomes, you don't know the variables, you experiment. You start off small and you expand your repertoire of issues and factors as you muddle through. If you believe we've got the answer, we are going to fall very, very short in a very quick uh, space of time. Thank you. For all the Thank you for your indulgence. For all the students who are in the room, and in case you hadn't worked it out, they're insulting each other really badly. <laughs> <laughs> Mark is now a sociologist who doesn't read economics, which, which I would recommend for anyone. Don't ever read economics, but that's neither here nor there. Panel, should we just take that as you as respond to as whatever you wish? Tasneem, I'll start with you and work. Okay, so no, th those were really useful. I'm not going to see this as a question and answer session. I think we should continue the conversation. But the one thing that I really, and it bothers me tremendously, and um, maybe it touches on what Thierry, you raising. I, I mean, I've operated in the space of the commission and we've developed the plan, etc. cetera. But um, I also hold other hats. And one of it is actually a very strong activist hat. I worked in the global space in an NGO, uh, negotiating this climate, uh, the, you know, up to Paris, uh, trying to get governments to agree. And what I realized was, no matter what we did at all these highly centralized spaces, what is missing, in fact, and is the lesson that we draw in our own history is that change, and no matter what kind of change that is, I believe fundamentally, just given our own history, 
actually comes through people's power. But the people are absent. And I mean, it's not like that was a big rocket science realization, of course. But now what I'm doing is actually working with the grassroots. Let me tell you about that. Um, and I'm not going to be crucifying you. The problem isn't about municipal finance and regular. Those are things that should be sorted out. The problem is that there isn't real participatory democracy in this country. So big decisions are being made about our energy future, our electricity future, actually, and the energy future. Big decisions. Do you know where government is consulting people? Where NERSA and ESCOM and the Department of Energy holds public participation processes? Not in any township. And please go and take a look at it. In fact, we are, these things are hosted in big hotels, in convention centers, That's and yet, and yet, sorry, <laughs> the energy future is being, you know, the impact of that energy future is going to impact on the poor, especially the most. So I think what is missing here is actually building, rebuilding grassroots people's power. And the most democratic form of technology, in my view, beside all the arguments that uh, Mark and others have presented around renewable energy, the most democratic technology, in my opinion, would be renewable energy. You can't socially own a nuclear plant. You can't socially own a coal plant. You co can't socially own big centralized infrastructure. But certainly, renewable energy by its very nature, the technology is you know, highly decentralized and can be highly democratic in the way we talk about ownership patterns, not just job creation in a renewable energy sector, but also ownership patterns. Who generates electricity? Surely it doesn't have to only be ESCOM or the, the bid winners in a REAP. It's communities can do that. So, but it wouldn't be nuclear, certainly, because I can't see communities owning that. And so for me, transformation includes ownership as well, the deep transformation of our economy and our society. I don't think she That's likes the points I'm making. <laughs> no? Not at all. If she's got the microphone. Okay. You tell us speak. what you'd like. Tell us. Okay, I'll leave it at this. Um, <laughs> on the question of uh, energy storage, um, of course, it, it may not be, have been included in the current energy plan, which is the RP2010, but it is definitely a, a part of the future energy system, um, at least that's how we see it. And uh, whether it will be battery storage or whether it will be thermal storage, there will be some storage that uh, forms part of the energy system. The question is, um, how do, I'm, I'm going to speak from the perspective of research and development. Uh, how does research and development uh, answer the questions of surrounding the cost of storage and what work needs to be done to get to a point where storage is as competitive as um, the, the, for the likes of photovoltaic uh, have reached at the moment. And, um, and we need to get to that point. Um, and then uh, the question of, um, of climate change adaptation, um, I think it's a very good point. Um, and something that has been completely ignored, I would say, because if you look at the Green Economy Accord, which was uh, agreed on in 2011, talks everything about mitigation. In fact, if you talk climate change mitigation and talk climate change adaptation, it's like two separate islands. Um, the, we, we don't seem to be talking to the same issue of addressing climate change. So we have seen recently, two years, two years ago, I think we had a massive drought in South Africa and currently we're going through storms. So we've got those distortions in the weather patterns and those need response. And how we respond to that can actually stimulate economic activity in the country and we need to talk about that totally agreed season. Yeah, um, I think what, uh, what's interesting about the, the REAP, the, the really interesting part about the REAP is it wasn't, 
uh, the outcome of a clearly articulated policy or plan. Mm -hmm. When I interviewed the head of the IPP unit with, uh, with Megan, uh, student Megan, uh, the, she, said, she said to us, you know, when we set, this up, uh, set up this op office, we thought there were going to be five plants. That was the assumption. There's a hundred and, and, and she never ever dreamed that there would be more than one plant per town. So there'd be five towns with five plants. There are 102 projects, and in places like Huffington, there are five or six plants. So what actually emerged is actually the outcome of an experiment that succeeded. Mm. And success built on success as the prices came down and the windows opened more windows opened and more bins opened and the goalposts were moved to inc continuously increase the, the, or move the target to increase the amount of renewable energy to bring, on the, bring onto the grid. And that's a pattern all over the world. The original targets are always moved because the learning curves are far, far faster than any of the most optimistic predictions. If you go to the work of Dan Kamen from the University of California and you, and you look at what his projections. He was, the, he was the leader of the optimist camp. If you look at the, his projections of the learning curves that he generated in the late 90s of what the uptake would be of renewable energy, and you compare them to the actual learning curves globally now, the actual learning curves are far, far, far steeper than the most optimistic projections were 10 years earlier. So this is all the outcome of experimentation that then replicates uh, mobilizes capital and expands and transforms uh, e economies. And that's what we have now killed uh, in South Africa now, as we take a great leap back into the 20th century um, and, and connect ourselves to an energy source, to energy sources twice the, twice the costs and prices going up, especially as the subsidies get removed. And so we are actually ignoring uh, harsh realities because we're blinded by previous paradigms. I personally don't think we access the economics of this through climate science. If we do things because of global warming and we're going to get flooded or whatever the case may be, with all due respect to the climate science, and Colleen is here, okay, we're friends, uh, the, the, actual <laughs> decisions, the actual decisions are going to be made uh, in rands and cents on economics. Uh, and, and, and if you want to put a climate uh, change gloss over it in order to justify it, it at certain times, well and good. But the actual decisions are going to be made around what, uh, what is your best return on investment. Um, and that's what's driving everything. So why, did, why, was, the, why was the policy cancelled? It was because of the nuclear deal. We haven't mentioned the nuclear deal here. Um, and, the, and the, the, actually, energy is at the very center of our political crisis. At the center of our political crisis is the nuclear deal. Everything is being destroyed to kind of deliver the nuclear deal uh, because of the deal that the, our president made with, 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 uh, with Putin. So we need to be realistic about the power play and why what has happened, what has happened. So let me give you one example of one of the consequences. I sit on the board of the Development Bank of South Africa. Our target for the last financial year was 17 billion rands worth of disbursements. Our actual, what we actually achieved was 13 and a half billion rands worth of disbursements. What was the difference? The difference was the, was the money that we made available to invest in the renewable energy power plants. This is hard cash that's not spent because of a policy decision that doesn't follow uh, the logic of the market, of what capital wants to flow into, what makes sense in terms of uh, returns on investment. One last, uh, uh, one last comment. It's interesting that nobody picked up on our two um, comments about the need for more social and public control of the renewable energy sector. And now Tasnim has really passionately kind of re-articulated that idea. Listen to this figure. Nearly 50%, 47% of all renewable energy infrastructure in Germany is socially controlled by communities or citizens. Mm -hmm. So that just reinforces the point that this, this, these socio-technical systems lend themselves for the kind of decentralization that Democrats 
especially us in South Africa, given our, our history of grassroots struggle, value. And it's, it's, it's doable. And there are, city, there are places around the world, for example, Medellin, Seoul, other places, cities around the world, that are setting up companies, municipal-owned con companies, <coughs> in order to own and procure their renewable energy power plants because they realize they don't actually need to be owned by big multinational corporations who, who need very, very deep pockets to invest in capital infrastructures over the very, very long term, which is what you need for coal-fired power stations and nuclear power stations. These are small little bits of kit that don't cost a lot of money, and you can actually finance them very, 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 very easily. And they're a sure bet in terms of return on, return on investment. Why can't, we, uh, why can't we just kind of follow, for once in South Africa, common sense? Long mm. tradition. Common sense. Um, there was the the mic who, who left, but for a general discussion. Um, I mean, I, I do think that the the issue of the region is important. Um, I also uh, think that uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I would uh, be interested in developing. A, a perspective about uh, what international collaboration would mean if you're expanding the sort of renewable frontier. And sometimes some of the uh, agreements, energy agreements through BRICS uh, that we've made don't make sense and they don't fit in with what we want to do locally. So th yeah. there is a, what a, an international sort of a, a perspective. Uh, uh, I, 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 I was quite keen, maybe someone can uh, say that uh, and develop it, because, I mean, we do have uh, something that I was involved in, in initially, which was the, the Southern African Power Pool, which was a, 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 a collaboration between the utilities in the region and wasn't uh, meant initially to be a competitive sort of trading arrangement. It was uh, for what one would call a solidaristic sort of initiative. And, and, and uh, without uh, basing uh, uh, this on that scale, maybe it would be important to see what, not, not the Southern African Power Pool as we know it now, the initial one, what can we learn uh, going forward in terms of uh, the sort of energy futures that we, 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 we're talking about. Um, look, I mean, uh, I mean, there is uh, something that isn't uh, uh, about sort of embedded uh, generation and what the municipalities are, are, are doing. Um, and, and I mean, we, we, we've always had a worry, I mean, as a union, uh, about uh, who is able to put all these on their rooftops and how rich people are able are able to this is now not only what they've sort of inherited but also it's becoming an important part of uh, making extra cash and and how for instance what's happening and sometimes it's celebrated uh, is uh, entrenching inequalities in in in, in south africa uh, so 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 I, I think the last thing I, I just want to say, which is, is, has not been here, is some of the work that uh, is, is being done on the levels of uh, energy and efficiencies within workplaces. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 government had sort of all these uh, uh, what they call pilots about uh, saving energy and energy inefficiency in the different uh, plants. Um, and uh, there was uh, some talk about uh, how that was going to lead to some policy on cogeneration, uh, which again are all those uh, papers that NERSA produces discussion, but that go nowhere. Thank you very much. Right, my right hand side of the room, I'll take three. One at the back, another one at the back, one in the front of the railing. Okay, there. One, two, three. Panel, if you're quick, we'll get to this plus one more round of questions. Uh, thank you. The name is Maloba Tesla, a colleague of Tavi and one of the co-authors. Um, I, have, I have a lot to say, but I'll, I'll make it one point. Thank you. 
Um, we seem to have these dialogues as if, I'll read what I've said because I've had very passionate reactions to some of the discussions, but we seem to be having these dialogues as if there was a specific technology that would solve the issue. Um, and we need to move away from that sort of discussion because we are venturing into something that is very unknown. Uh, this climate change issue is completely beyond anything we can imagine. Um, and the solutions to it are also in a place that we can't imagine currently. Um, we have a history in South Africa, uh, and the fact that we haven't changed a lot since then, uh, which magnifies the kind of economic shift that is needed. Uh, if we talk about things like storage, it's still an archaic way of looking at technology. What if we shift the way we use energy as a whole? What if we shift the patterns of energy use and loads and make those meet uh, different technologies that are becoming available. Uh, we yeah. talk about financing, uh, the innovations around that that have changed old financing and um, funding models where the communities can now invest in them. We have technologies like Bitcoin, we have crowdfunding, uh, and we have now business models that allow savings to fund your infrastructure. Uh, and so you don't need to have the capital upfront costs uh, borne out by, by, by the end user. So we, we really do need to move away from specific technology and specific sectors uh, being solutions, but a way of relating to how we consume resources and thinking around that and innovating around that with an acknowledgement that we don't know where we're going and the consequences thereof. Thank you. I'll put it back again. It's looking at me. Okay, then. no, thank you. Um, I mean, on my side, basically, I just want to kind of like um, speak on the point that, you know. We can't hear you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, I just want to speak on the point that, you know, some things are kind of, you know, quite uh, depressing, especially when you look at it in the, in the perspective of, um, you know, developing, especially the communities, to be part of this, uh, in your, you know, renewable energy. Um, I will speak specifically of the political, you know, not the political one, the will to kind of like the economy, actually I would say it's political economy will, basically in terms of how can you really do this? Like, are you willing to do this? Can you do it? For example, we have a great track record of having these plans, these, especially in the state perspective, uh, policies that they never get, you know, implemented. We have the struggle in the, in, you know, in terms of that as well. Uh, now the problem, what I'm actually raising, is through the experience that, you know, you try to bring this actually new. Actually, it's not even a new solution. When it actually, I will speak in, in the context of Pick It Up, for example. Pick It Up has got a massive uh, challenge in terms of they've got they can renew like plastic uh, materials, but they've got a problem in terms of how can we handle it? that is the food uh, items. Now they are running out of land space, especially where they throw up this thing. Now, you come up with these uh, solutions, for example, turning that to fertilizers, that's a very easy solution, but the will that you get there, you get rejections, like there's too much of that. So how can, in that perspective, especially when I see how can we, I mean, what are the cha you know, plans, basically, to kind of like help, you know, ease out the way? You know? Someone over there. Yes, <laughs> After you. Oh, okay. Oh, thanks very much. My name is Plebo. Um, for, I just want to pose a quick one to Ivo about what he said about food security. <clears throat> Does food security have a negative impact on this green economy? On this green economy? So I wanted to see if maybe the relationship is it adverse or there are some benefits if you can uh, bring the, the two together. And then the other thing that I want to say is that uh, why maybe is this, there is no appetite or little appetite in these green economy initiatives? Even when you speak about climate smart agriculture, we seem not to be to be to be positive or speaking with with a resounding way to say this is the way to go. And lastly, I always say government, business, labor and academia. Don't leave out academia. Some people might be wanting to implement these programs, but they don't know how to do them. They don't even know anything. The moment we talk about nuclear, all we think about the Russians are going to steal the money. Yeah. 
pretty much. Down here. It's your turn. So. Um, I guess I'm the token woman from the from the audience. Um, I, I I feel as if we're speaking around the issues. Of course, we can admit that it was all too complex. And of course, we can admit that we were too enthusiastic and naive. But in the cold light of day, there are investors and there are shareholders and there are communities who feel as if they've been missled. In terms of contract law and in, public, in terms of public-private partnerships, there ought to be accountability. What is to be done now? So the easy one last. Colleagues, you can take any of those that you wish. And then I'll come to Ivor for his response on food security. Should we go the other way around? I'll start yeah. with Jamie. I'll go that way. OK. <coughs> what, what can be done? All right. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, uh, as someone who's uh, defended a uh, utility when it was there was a plan to, to break it up, I think in the last few years I've realized that a utility that claims to be acting on behalf of the public but is driven by self-interest is not what we need. So some of the issues about what to do with ESCOM that acts as a monopoly is something that we've got. I'm not talking privatization. Remember, I'm a unionist. But I think that the idea of a vertically integrated, centralized is, is, is showing to be a big, big stumbling, stumbling, stumbling block. I do think that uh, we had all these uh, uh, changes uh, or emerging uh, convergence uh, because of uh, certain uh, conditions. I don't, I don't think that uh, we're going to see any change unless we, we solve the politics. Uh, the, 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 I, I think that we need a political solution. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 there's so many interests who are sort of clinging onto, onto this. And I don't think that it's just a clever policymakers who produce another document. We, we've got to go into how the rot is uh, set in. And unless we address this politically, I, I don't think there's a... There's a and we're going to see a lot of uh, illegal wrangling because, uh, uh, I mean, the one billion of our members, they want it. And the, you know, there was an agreement. And, and there's going to be that. Um, so so, so uh, I, I think we've got to deal with this politically. So I, I would I would agree uh, strongly with you. Um, my worry is that uh, ESCOM is our biggest SRE. State guarantees for ESCOM are over 300 billion at the moment. If you compare that to the the, the crisis about SAA, I think the the guarantees for SAA are only about 17 billion. So you know, so the scale of the ESCOM mess is very, very frightening. And I was at a Rand Merchant Bank uh, event recently where I was asked to talk about betrayal of the promise and uh, a whole bunch of CEOs of all sorts of companies were there and they were talking seriously about the threat to the South African financial system if ESCOM goes down. They made a statement, ESCOM goes down, the financial institutions go down. That's, and that was actually said in this meeting. Um, so my prediction is that we probably won't make the big, big decisions to dismantle ESCOM quickly enough, and it's going to trigger an IMF bailout. And the conditions of the IMF bailout will force us to do what we could have done voluntarily, but won't do in time. That's my prediction of how we're going to actually bite the bullet. And it's sad and... It's, but that's, uh, I think, the reality. Um, I think it's linked to this whole local government story, uh, which uh, I, I think is um, 
the, the idea that local government stands to lose with the spread of renewable energy is punted by the professional associations, the local government professional association. And it's empirically also untrue. So a lot of research that uh, my colleagues have done at Stellenbosch University shows that local authorities can get in the business, can get into the renewable energy business. They don't necessarily have to see the opting out of uh, our households that are installing renewable energy as a threat to their local government finance system. They can actually move towards what is happening all over the world, which is you charge people who, want to, who, who don't want to buy electricity, you charge them a grid connection fee because they're using the grid as a battery. And you, and you charge them for that. And when you run the numbers, you can actually build a very, very viable financial model, but you have to stop the rich from seceding. Uh, from the system. So the rich can afford to secede, and then everybody else is actually subsidizing the grid through their tariffs. And it's highly, highly regressive. But the, but the research that has been done at Stellenbosch University shows that the, uh, there are financial models and some local authorities starting to implement them in the Western Cape that can actually turn this into a progressive uh, strategy. Uh, and that's going to be the next wave in the, in, in, the, in the renewable energy sector in South Africa. So I think these two issues, one focuses on, on, on national state, state strategy of how, how we actually tackle the ESCOM disaster, uh, and the other is how we start seeing local government as a, as a potential major player in the 21st century economy. Um, spoke about accountability. Uh, to the investors, accountability to the communities. But I think the biggest accountability is to the consumer of electricity because they are the ultimate funder of um, new generation capacity, if I can put it like that. Uh, currently, ESCOM is requesting an increase in electricity tariffs by 19.9%, which is 20%. And the consumer of electricity is the most affected and they have to fork out money in their already constrained budget. So if there's any accountability in, um, in planning and developing of this project, uh, it's certainly to the general public and, uh, and to the consumer. And then on the question of um, just transition, I wanted to just go back to that. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I think we have reached consensus that transition is um, inevitable. It is going to happen. And I'm also glad to hear the union actually uh, saying that we need to plan towards the transition because in 20, 30 years' time, we're definitely going to have a reduced amount of coal in the power system. And what is going to happen to uh, the current whole ecosystem that is built around uh, the coal-fired power stations. There's a perception that um, there's going to be a replacement of jobs. So re developing renewable energy is going to replace the coal job, and it's not going to happen like that. And we need to face that reality. Um, there's regional issues involved. Uh, renewable energy projects are built along the coast in the Northern Cape, Coal-fired power stations are mostly in the Pumalanga and Limpopo, and we need to know as, as, as we invest in these other regions and stimulating economic activity that was never there, what is going to happen uh, in these regions where we are losing economic activity. So we need to start thinking about um, what is it, what economic activities are we going to stimulate in those regions that are going to replace the jobs, rather than thinking about renewable energy directly replacing the coal jobs and economic activities? Yeah, so I think the other interesting dimension to the, the kind of pushback um, is the space of litigation. So we've seen some interesting cases come up in the country. Of course, the nuclear case um, with the Earth Life and uh, the Center for Environmental Rights. They've successfully challenged uh, two coal IPPs right now. And the courts are recognizing that climate change is a factor in this decision making. 
So I, I think it's, uh, yes, you know, capital flows, etc., are drivers of, of a lot of change. But more and more, as things become really, really real, climate change is going to become a driver of a lot of um, change, disruption, etc. And I like the, the point that was made um, by that gentleman over there about not tying yourself to one thing, yeah. that there are many, many disruptions possible. I like to think about that also about us reimagining what our future could look like. Mm. But I think we, you know, when we, when we talk, just in the way we talk as South Africans, everything has to either be big or government must do it or it needs some kind of commercial value. And so all the, the possibilities of small of collective versus individual, of um, creative, of valuing things that aren't necessarily uh, related to money, etc. Those things just get thrown out of the door. And I think the future we're entering, I'm not a prophet, so I won't actually know what's going to happen in the future. But I certainly do hope that the future that we are probably going to be forced to enter is going to have to be one of caring, of solidarity, because the alternative is just too horrible to contemplate. And I don't think we're even starting to think about that as South Africans. Because ours is about GDP growth. Ours is about capital flows. Ours is about a big infrastructure. Ours is about everything but caring. It's about getting rich. Um, and what we value, etc., is highly debatable. So I think that it's complex. And yes, planning, uh, I was right. I mean, you're not going to have a blueprint for the transition. But if we're not even sitting around a table having the conversations about transitions, then that's a problem. And we're not. We're actually not. Let alone social partners at a high level, let alone people on the ground. So I think we have a huge, that's the complexity. We're not having the conversation. And it's unethical, actually. Because there's a, a climate change and its impacts are going to be, I mean, if you think what's happening now, our experiences here in this country and in what's happening in the Caribbean and now what's going to happen in Ireland, all of these now for the first time can be attributed to climate change. In the past, people were reluctant to do that, scientists, but now it is. So I think we have to be prepared because it's ethical for us to get people to understand these things. So I do want to bring in the kind of moral and ethical dimension, not just the economic, financial, etc. dimension of this. Thank you. There was a question aimed at Ira. I'll restrict myself to food security. In America, uh, biodiesel with corn, the price of corn went through the roof in terms of truckers uh, using biodiesel because it was cost parity, but uh, more environmentally friendly. Imagine if we did that in South Africa, with uh, maize Smart being a staple friendly. of so many people. Uh, it just wouldn't work. So, so I think government is right to restrict the crops that can be used for biofuels. So biodiesel is out in terms of corn. Number of initiatives to recycle cooking oil into diesel. And I think that's the way to go. And some significant initiatives in bioethanol in terms of blending with petrol. A uh, big plant in the Eastern Cape uh, in that regard. So on that one, I think government has been quite responsible in dealing with uh, biofuels. Okay. Is there one last burning question? Yeah. That's someone, uh, oh, yeah. that's someone who hasn't spoken before. There are no, two I'm burning sure questions. Me. Four. No, come on. No, six. Ah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go one and one. Nice, really. one lady, I was pointing at a lady. And she's grabbing the mic to make sure that it's her. You're the second token woman, apparently. That was quick, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll be really quick. Um, no one has mentioned, when you're talking about costs, no one talked about the cost of health. Your workforce health is going to influence your economy. And the Highfield area has the highest prevalence of suspected TB cases, meaning it's not really TB, it's lots of respiratory symptoms. And when you talk about the green economy, you cannot exclude health, and that's what this meme talks about being caring. But also just for the economists, because you have to talk money, there's a cost 
implication when your workforce is not healthy. That's Thank it. You. Gentleman over there. Um, and I'll take one of the two hands over there. My name is Sunny, and they call me Sunny the Solar Guy, so you'll know what the <laughs> question's about. Um, the panel seems very pessimistic on grid scale or utility scale um, solar PV. I'm wondering what the views are on um, embedded generation. I've personally installed uh, over 50 residential installations. I do about five kilowatts a week. Um, and, um, and we're doing it, I must admit, and I hope ESCOM's not in the room, or City Power. I'm doing it without permission because people are now cut for, for uh, the issues that with applying for uh, registration or applying for licensing. It takes far too long. So uh, I read somewhere that the scope or the scale or the potential for rooftop embedded at, for private individuals uh, are almost uh, 30, um, uh, 20 to 30 gigawatts, which is actually two or three times bigger than the REAP program. Um, thanks. Um, I just want to say a disclaimer uh -huh. before, before I, I actually pose my question. Uh, that I don't know much about uh, renewable energy and, all, and a lot of things, just that what you read from the articles, a few YouTube videos, what you see, but this has been very informative. And uh, I can see that the issue is very complex. So I think uh, the views uh, between the two that are spilled, because uh, uh, I, I don't want to argue with uh, empirical evidence. Uh, I just want to ask the question that if renewable energy is so uh, cost effective and you know that uh, economic decisions uh, basically are based on profits and everything, why is there seems to be a lag with uh, big corporations actually opting for renewable energy? Wouldn't that be the, the, the best cost benefit analysis of the whole side? Sure. Thank you. Okay, that's it for the questions. I'm sorry if you're still burning. So the panel, please restrict yourselves to as brief as you can. And I'll start with Tasneem again and go that way. So, <coughs> there are, there's lots of corporates that are actually taking up renewable energy and, in fact, setting targets for 100% renewable energy, etc. Um, banks, uh, retail stores, and others. Mark's spoken about cogen. A lot of the corporates that have looked at cogen have looked at renewable energy as part of that cogen as well. So they are, it is, because it's making good financial sense, right? So um, one of the things that I think that, I know we've raised this already, about, and, and we know we must look at the utility and the importance of the utility. But I think what we are going to experience, and it's already, you know, as we can hear from Mr. Solar, Sunny over there, <laughs> there's just going to be a bottom-up bottom up revolution around these things. Yeah. And what worries me is what Mark raised and, and Dinga about the inequities that can exist yeah, around that. Absolutely. And that's why it's important. Yes, so of course, there's going to be solar. There'll be space for big reprograms, etc. But I do think quite quickly, and I'm not sure if ESCOM is going to be able to do this and has it in its, you know, they're supposed to have a developmental mandate and they're not fulfilling any of their mandates properly, um, that you ensure that equity through having decentralized community owned or socially owned renewable energy systems as well. That's not happening at scale in any way. It's probably hopefully going to happen if the unions could lead it. But the, uh, you know, the state of where the unions are on this matter is, is really, really worrying. Th that is my big problem with it. Just getting people to have individual PVs are going to be for those who can afford it. And we won't have justice and equity and it just, just nullifies everything that needs to happen in terms of ensuring a just transition. Uh, and so we have to balance all these things out with what I believe is socially owned or community owned renewable energy systems. Um, health benefits of uh, renewable energy. I'm actually glad that uh, you raised that question because uh, we, are, we are currently busy with uh, the analysis of various co-benefits of increased penetra penetration of renewable energy into the uh, South African power system. And one of those core benefits that have been prioritized is the health costs. 
um, looking at it from the point of, um, as you transition from the carbon intensive power system to a clean uh, energy power system, uh, how much are you saving in terms of health costs and uh, how much impact are you making in terms of improved livelihoods of uh, people, particularly because there is data available uh, in areas that are directly affected around the power stations, uh, respiratory conditions, clinics, hospitals are keeping data. It's a matter of collating the information and making an analysis and seeing this is the impact and if we reduce the amount of carbon coming from the power station, this can actually be uh, the health cost and actually quantify it in terms of monetary value what uh, the contribution is going to be. Very good point. So, if the economy did run on cost-benefit analysis, in other words, if what you were taught in Economics 101 was true, and I'd advise you to forget everything you learned, <laughs> um, then you would, and become a sociologist, yes. <laughs> uh, then uh, you, would, you would understand it's all about power rather than rational decision making. Um, and that's the problem that we currently face. Nevertheless, despite that, do you know how much money was not spent because of the recent decision? 25 billion was pledged, actual projects ready to roll, just by signing the pen, signing the paper, 25 billion would have flowed. So all of those corporations putting, and, and financial institutions putting that 25 billion, yes, into an incorrect architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what were, why were they doing that? Under extremely competitive conditions where the margins are small, they can still make a return on investment. So what does that tell you, even if you do believe what you're taught in Economics 101? And as far as uh, embedded PV is concerned, that's definitely the wave of the future. I agree completely with uh, uh, Tasnim, but I would advise you uh, and your business to get out of individual installations and into neighborhood installations, especially if they are socially mixed communities. So I want to tell you a good news story about ESCOM. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 16 years ago, I uh, was part of a, a wonderful little group that built a socially mixed eco-village, which is still going, called the Lindock Eco-Village, where my institute is located, the Sustainability Institute. And ESCOM has come to the realization that they are going to have to face embedded, uh, embedded PV and uh, two-way metering. And they were looking for a community around the country which is socially mixed, that they could build a laboratory with. And one of the only ones they could really come across was this eco-village that we, 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 that we built. So they have installed, ESCOM has installed at their expense, a South Africa's first mini-grid system for a socially mixed community with smart metering. On every single roof with one, is 1,500 watts with an inverter, a, 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 an SMA, a kind of Rolls-Royce of inverters, SMA uh, inverter, batteries, grid connected, within a, a mini grid, in other words, one meter onto the grid, and, and smart apps on, on, on all the smartphones so that you can, you can trade, uh, you can create an alternative currency inside of, the, inside of the village. And this is extremely progressive stuff really progressive stuff, and that is the future. Socially mixed communities facilitated by what you require for a viable, equitable energy system that is inclusive. That must be part of the future. And I agree with you, it can't just be the standalone, grid-connected, uh, medium-sized uh, power plants. That's, that's, we only have that because of the restrictions that were placed on the REAP that forced you to build these plants of a certain size and upwards. If we took that away, what Tasnim is talking about would just, would just rocket. But what you are doing is you are taking ESCOM's best clients, and they will never go back to ESCOM. And that's a disaster for our system. All right. Um, 
after that uh, good story about escom <laughs> let's <laughs> so like an ad <laughs> look i mean i, I, I think an experiment I, yes uh, <laughs> I, i do think that uh, a point was raised about uh, the need for us to imagine a a different future and that uh, unless we begin to think about how things can be done differently we're not going to get out of this quagmire and as i think as we talk about a decentralized sort of energy system we also need to imagine a decentralized political system and financial system because just as an example what happened we we were at a point where there was a establishment of regional electricity distribution mm. rates mm. and 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 when the rates were about to be established and there was red 1 and there was going to be red 2 a meeting in a, in deben at a hotel at the national general council decided of the anc let's do away with the rates and it was in a hotel room that this decision because of the centralized nature this became the policy and therefore the idea of a different level spheres of government contesting and taking different positions and experimenting differently yeah, yeah. is what is going to lead us into a real path of experimentation we can't think about uh, imagine a decentralized energy system without thinking about the other systems also being decentralized Thank you very much can colleagues. Just, uh, so oh, no no not. <laughs> can I just add to that um if we are going to achieve um the maximum impact of the green economy I think it it requires us to sort of move uh, slightly away from a policy controlled environment. Um the point that you've just made there's a lot of programs that have been tried in the past and have collapsed and mm. all it needs is someone to press a stop button and everything collapses mm. it's the red it's the ismobile it's the renewable energy ipp procurement program because everything um is dependent on policy decisions so i think it's time that um like tasnimo was saying we need to start building a bottom up um industry that private investors um will have to take up decisions on their own to say we are investing in this and it's not dependent on whether or not government can agree to that and that is how we are going to achieve a benefit in the economy okay colleagues thank you very much i should say before we thank all these the, the, it's interesting to note that we're heading after this to a round table to talk technical stuff but the words that were used the most actually in the discussion apart from revolution which was only used once um but were words like ethics politics inequality and people the technicalities of all this which you can argue about forever were not the point and i think it's important to remember that that is the point of a national development plan it's not about the technicalities it's about how on earth you lift people out of poverty and create some kind of social justice and i think that's where the conversation went through its various interstices so i thank you all for that i thank all the panelists both the paper uh, presenters who were there beforehand and I invite you to join us for snacks at the back in the canteen thank you very much indeed